In chapter 11, I want to introduce you to two forms of one word. And they're not all sham and chata'ah, as lovely as those words are. I would like to introduce you to the word ordinances and ordinances. Capital O versus small o. Here's what I'm looking for. In my view, a capital O ordinance is something Jesus commanded the church to do as a symbol throughout all their time. So in going, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you in Matthew 28, 19, is a capital O ordinance, meaning it's a symbol that God gave through the mouth of Jesus for the church of Jesus Christ to observe. A small O ordinance, in my view, is a local church finds that there is an error being taught in their church or believed among their people, and so they assign a specific symbol to help people know that that is wrong. Proposition. I go to the Mosquito Indians in Central America, and I find out that they are not sure that the blood of Jesus takes away sin. Now they are, this is a hypothetical, but it, 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 that, that's say that was the case. Let's say the church that's located along the Cocoa River decides that in order to teach this principle, we are going to require all men to put underneath of their um, flip-flops, slippers, sandals, red socks. You are to wear red socks to church. And when you put red socks on, as stupid as it looks to put them underneath your sandal slippers or um, flip-flops, you are to say, Jesus' blood takes away our sin. And then you are to wear them to church. And we will check that you are wearing them to church. And we will ask you, did you remember to say the blood of Jesus took away our sin? Now, after six months, when everybody's got that, we say, all right, the small O symbol ordinance of socks is done away. Does everybody understand what I did? I gave you a symbol that was an earthly symbol that had a heavenly meaning or theological meaning, and I assigned it from the local church, from an eldership, in order to ascribe something in that community that did not need to be ascribed in every community of all times and all places. If we have, right now, we're in a fellowship of about 3,500 churches that we belong to. And in that fellowship, the, fellow, the part of our fellowship that is in Africa is larger than the part that's in North America. But in Africa, we are making bold statements against female circumcision. You will not find those statements in the North America because we're not having the problem, but they are. So in their area, they have certain things they're teaching that are in harmony with what we're teaching, but we don't teach it because we don't need to. Conversely, in America, we are teaching things about women in leadership uh, that, that they don't have as a problem because they don't have women who are trying to be. So in different parts of the world, different issues prevail. A small O ordinance is not a universal ordinance. A large O ordinance is a universal ordinance, okay? Having said that, let's go to be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. In other words, follow me because you see me following Jesus. And then he stops and he says, and this is the, this is the verse I put a box around in verse uh, chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. The traditions he's speaking of are two. The first one is a woman covering her head the head covering ordinance, that is, the woman wearing something on her head as a symbol of authority over her head. Where do you find it? Verse 10, therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. We'll come back and deal with the issue in just a few moments. But the first half of this is all about a woman wearing something on her head as part of the, um, the service, okay? Now, it seems to me that everything he's going to deal with in chapter 11 is about public services, not about every moment of her life, okay? And in verses 23 to 34, the second half of the passage is on the Lord's Supper. So, the first half of the passage seems to me to be a small O ordinance. 
The second half is clearly a capital O ordinance. Why? Because the second one Jesus told us to do, the first one he didn't. But, obviously, elders of the early church and apostles of the early church told them they needed to do this. So, the first half of the passage, in my view, is not something that everybody of all times and all places needs to do. The second half of the passage is something that every Christian church ought to be involved in. So he says, I'm glad that you're following what I gave you to do. I'm glad that you are doing exactly that. And then in the first half, he talks about what the Corinthian uh, men and women were doing. However, the problem for the Roman was the opposite problem that you have. Okay? The issue in the first half of chapter 11 for you is should a woman put a covering on her head? There was no Roman who thought that was the problem. Because in every case where there's sacred things being done in Roman society, women have their head covered. In other words, this wasn't a group of pagan women who, who had to be taught to put something on their head. All Roman women wore something over their head for any sacred festival at all. How do I know that? Well, if you go to Rome, you can go to the um, Memorial of the Augustan Peace and you will see an entire procession and every one of the women will have their head covered. If I take you to Pompeii and I take you to the um, uh, uh, Eumachia uh, uh, shopping mall, she is standing there as a sacred priestess and her head is covered. Covering of a head was normal for a Roman woman. The shocking part of chapter 11 was about Roman men, not about Roman women. The shocking part was that men were to take their caps off when they prayed. Why is that shocking? Because the symbol of Roman freedom was a pileus. A pileus is a hat. It looks almost like an elf hat, okay? And if you look on, he looks sort of like a jester, I know, but the, it's a hat that's leaning forward. This was the symbol of freedom. A freeborn Roman had a hat that said, I'm free. And if you were to look on the coins, after Julius Caesar in the Ides of March was killed in the area of Pompey's theater by a ver uh, group of people including Brutus, the coin that they minted to say we are free had a Peleus on it. It's the symbol of Roman male freedom. I am a free Roman. I have the hat. Okay? So it is as symbolic to a Roman free man as a ball cap is to a baseball player. So I want you to read it with that in mind, not with 21st century America in mind, okay? Verse 3. I want you to understand that there is a chain of responsibility, that, the, that Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of, uh, of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Here's what he says. He says, if you put it in order... It's God, Christ, man, woman. Now here's my point. This is not a chain of value. Christ is not worth less than God. This is a chain of responsibility. That Christ did that which honored God. That man is to do that which honors Christ and the woman is to do that which honors her man. She follows Christ by following him. I follow God by following Christ. Does that make sense? It's a chain of responsibility, not an estimation of value. For me to make the argument that a woman is worth less than a man is for me to make the same argument that Christ is worth less than God. So the theology of it falls apart. Here's what he says. Every man who has something on his head. Now, I want you to do something with me. I'm going to put some P's next to some words here. There, here's the problem. There's physical head and spiritual head. I don't have time to, to tear apart with you how I came up with this. Let me simply tell you 
that I'm going to put a P next to all the head that is physical head, meaning this one, and S who is uh, next to spiritual head, meaning headship. Okay? Follow me in verse 3 very closely. I want you to understand that Christ is the S head, spiritual head of every man, and the man is the S spiritual head of a woman, and God is the S spiritual head of Christ. Does that make sense? That this is a chain of spiritual responsibility. Now go to verse 4. Every man who has something on his P, physical head, while praying or prophesying, disgraces his S, spiritual head. Does that make sense? If you put a hat on when you pray, you're disgracing your spiritual head. That's what he's saying. Physical head is hat. Physical head covering is hat. Spiritual is chain of responsibility. Okay? Verse 5. But every woman who has her P, physical head, uncovered while praying or prophesying, disgraces her S, spiritual head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose, whose P, physical head, is shaven. Now, you're going to read comments that say prostitutes shave their head in the New Testament. It's nonsense. So the bottom line is, it's pretty risque stuff, but the reality is I don't think he's saying that prostitutes are both. What he's saying is the glory of a woman is her hair. And if she's going to leave it uncovered, she's, uh, she is, she is um, it's, it's like showing up to a banquet with no shirt and no shoes. Okay? It's, it's totally inappropriate. It's just wrong. All right, take a look at this. Verse 5 then, every woman who has her P, physical head, uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her S, spiritual head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose P, physical head, is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her P, physical head, let her also have her hair cut off, but it is disgraceful for the woman to have her hair cut off or her P, physical head, shaved, let her cover her P, physical head. For a man ought to ha not to have his P, physical head, covered, since he is the image and the glory of a God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her P, physical head, because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of a man, nor is a man independent of a woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. It is, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her P, physical head, uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you have come together, for the, not for the better, but for the worse. And then he goes on to another issue. Now stop there. What, what is he saying? First, he's saying that there is a chain of responsibility, not a chain of value. And that women are equal to men in value, but different to men in responsibility. That God is equal to, uh, Jesus is equal to God in value, but not equal in responsibility. Verse 4, he says, when men are praying or prophesying, they should have their physical head uncovered. We take our hats off in church, not as a cultural courtesy, but as a biblical ordinance. But the biblical ordinance is a small o ordinance out of respect for what God told the first century church. There is no command of God that he can't hear you when, when you pray if you have a ball cap on. If you are in the middle of a battle, don't take your helmet off, just pray with your hat on. God understands. 
As the bullets fly by, it's not a wise time to take the helmet off your head. There's not, what he's saying is in Corinth in the first century and in the churches, because he says it, it's also true of the other churches, he says, gentlemen, take the hat off. That would have been shocking to a Roman. Why? He just gave his symbol of freedom and, and took now the look of a slave. Why is that important? Why was it symbolic to him to take his hat off? Because he's a slave of Jesus Christ. And he just has removed his freedom. He's no longer coming to God of, I am a free Roman, proud as they were. He's now coming as a humbled Christian, slave of Jesus Christ. That's what they would have been reading. Now, what women came with their head uncovered to sacred festivals? Prostitutes. And what he said is, stop looking like hookers. Put your, put your veil over top of you like respectable Roman women. Don't you know better? Don't show up and uncover your head in a sacred festival. Gentlemen, don't cover it. Ladies, don't uncover it. Now, does that mean you all need to buy hats? Why not? For the same reason you can have ham. There's a command given to a specific group of people for a specific situation. And in the first century, they were facing something very specific. However, if in our church, our elders got together and said, we want women to come with veils for the next six months because we want to make a statement about something that's going on in our church, should you wear one, ladies? Yes. So a small ordinance is local teaching for the purpose of getting spiritual truth. It's not universal. It doesn't go on forever. And one of the problems with churches is we know how to start things. We just don't know how to stop them. It seems like everything we ever started, we're supposed to keep doing. Well, that's not really practical. What Paul says is in the first century, every single church, every woman was taught to put a veil over her head. You know why? Most Roman women didn't have any problem with it. They already were doing it. But the few that weren't, particularly those who were showing up in the atrium in the still of the night who came from the brothels, probably didn't even own one. Somebody had to give them one to stick it on their head. You have all these people coming to Jesus who don't know anything about God or how to act. They know how to work in a brothel. That's what they know how to do. And we've got to understand that Paul's got to deal with this. These are people that are walking in. By the way, talk about a weird situation. Just think about it for a moment. You grow up working the brothel. The man who comes in now comes to Christ. He doesn't come back anymore. You come to Christ and you both end up in the same church. How weird would that be? Anybody else think that would be weird besides me? Okay, that's a first century problem. We think we have all the cutting edge problems. They had huge issues going on. So imagine now all of a sudden, and, and seriously, we have gotten to the place where we are coming from a time where we've almost been Puritans compared to what they had. You have to understand how earthy this group was. They're, they're, they're meeting each other in the still of the night, hoping they don't get discovered. And the biggest, thing they're, the biggest thing they're enraged about is not the latest movie that comes out. They got a lot of issues to deal with, and Paul's trying to deal with them. Now, all I'm saying to you is the Peleus meant that the man was probably more shocked by this teaching than the woman, and that the pride of the Roman male was probably more under attack here than the gentility of the Roman woman. Let me go past that and go down to the second half of the chapter. He felt pretty good about a lot of the things they were doing, according to verse 2. But according to verse 17, he didn't feel good about one that they were doing. And that was, in giving this instruction, I do not, I do not praise you, because you come together for, not for the better, but for the worse. So this has to do with the coming together in public worship, but the worse for it. And in verse 18, it says, In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions exist among you, and I partly believe it. Paul makes the argument that if your church is going to come together and be divided and go to separate parts because you don't like each other, you'd be better off not coming. 
that it's actually worse. You're hurting the cause of Christ. And then in verse 19 he said, For there must also be factions among you, so that you who approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry, the other is, another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. And then he goes on and he gives the formula of the Eucharist part of the communion service. In the early church, when they came together, they not only had bread and cup, they also ate a meal called the agape feast, the love feast. You'll see this show up later on in James where these are spots on your love feast. Um, the, the important thing is that's what they were doing. So when they came together here, apparently some people were coming with lots of food and literally overindulging and getting sloppy fat drunk while other people were sitting next to them with morsels of bread and nothing to eat because they barely had anything. And instead of coming together and sharing like they should have, some were being abused and humiliated and other people were overindulging and all of that was sin. So he says down in verse 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Now, underline in an unworthy manner in verse 27. Unworthily or in an unworthy manner does not mean that the people are worthy. You're never going to be worthy of a communion wafer. Jesus died for the unworthy. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you can pray especially hard and get clean and then become worthy. He's talking about doing it in the right manner. Unworthily is an adverb. It's according to the verb. How are you doing it? So here's what he says in verse 27. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the, word, uh, of the Lord in a, a wrong way. That's what he's saying. That is, by taking advantage of some and not eating together and not being considering the Lord's body his church, that person will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. So what I don't want you to do is come in and think, oh, i got to pray really hard so I become worthy. No. He's saying, do it the right way or you'll get sick. God will discipline his church if you don't do it the right way. What's the right way? In a way that doesn't humiliate people. In a way that people aren't getting drunk. In a way that the body is coming together and growing and joining through it, not being destroyed by it. So he says, verse 28, Every one of you let a man examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In other words, examine whether or not you are doing this properly. Not examine whether or not your heart is good enough. That's not the point. He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he does not judge the body, and by the way, the word body there is the church, rightly. The body of Christ, meaning this body, not the body that this represents. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you sleep. You can write next to that, um, James 5.14. It is possible that people are getting sick and are dying because they are mishandling God's word. They're mishandling Christ's body. What does he tell them to do in verse 33? Underline the words, wait for one another. Wait for one another. In other words, stop. Don't just come and pig out. Wait for the other people. So chapter 11 closes with big O and large, uh, uh, small O ordinance. Does everybody understand, if I were to quiz you, what's the difference between a capital O ordinance and a small O ordinance? Well, small O, you have to do it if you're in that church at that time. But a big O, all churches of all times, because who said so? Jesus, that's it. Okay, let's move on now to uh, spiritual gifts. And in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he moves past the ordinances, and there are prob apparently at least four specific problems that came into the public services of Corinth and the Corinthian congregation. First, and I want you to understand what each of these problems are, because if you don't, it's like this. If you don't understand this first part, the rest of what I say about spiritual gifts will seem weird. Well, it may seem weird anyway, but the point is that you won't get what I'm trying to say, okay? First, apparently somebody shared in a public worship setting a revelation 
from God that Jesus, because of the crucifixion, was accursed by God. They evidently encouraged the congregation to follow after something other than Jesus. So the first problem was Apparently, somebody came to the conclusion that they had a revelation from God that Jesus was accursed because he hung on the tree. And so, it, you know, why? Because the scripture says, cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. And therefore, you should not be looking for Jesus as your method of full justification because he was accursed. Is that right or wrong? Is everybody sure that's wrong? Okay, but the Corinthians weren't sure because somebody got up and said, I have a word from God, and they said this. And it caused a problem. Second problem. It appears that some in the congregation were emphasizing the unity and unchanging nature of God, and they couldn't believe that God's gifts were not similar in their manifestations. So they believed that the unity of God equals... Same gifts. Everybody's got these gifts. If you really have Jesus, you speak in tongues. If you really have Jesus, you can do miracles. If you really have, fill in, it doesn't matter what you fill in the blank with. The point is, they saw a one-size-fits-all unity God. The difference between unity and uniformity. Unity means that we will all be together. Uniformity means everybody wears the same hairstyle and the same t-shirt. And they confuse the two. Okay? Third problem. And then we'll address the verses and you'll see them. The third problem. Some people apparently were arguing about whether some unique manifestations in the lives of the believers were gifts of God or mere express expressions of differing personalities. They, were, they felt like um, some of the so-called gifts were necessary for the body. They're probably saying things like, you know, Pastor, that stuff just isn't important. What we need here in Corinth is more of... So what they were doing is they were confusing... Gifts of the Spirit with personality. with differing personalities. They were saying, yeah, that's not really a gift. That's just my personality. And so they couldn't, they didn't get straight. What's, what is the gifting of God and what is the personality? And the fourth problem, and this one's a, another big problem for the church. It's in the background. Is many that got excited about the sense of the flow of the Spirit using them became convinced that their gift was the key to everything in the world. So some of them, elevated their gift as, as the key. When God's really at work, there's always tongues. When God's really at work, there's always mercy. Where God's really at work, there's always giving. Where God's really at work, there's always teaching. And what happened is they were elevating one gift above the others. So Paul, with that background, with these problems, has to start addressing it. Now, some of you are going to go, how does Randy know what these four are? After I carefully studied Roman, uh, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, I came to the conclusion that if you reverse the narrative, if you say these are the answers, what are the problems, you'll come up with these four problems. Okay? I don't have time to do it with you. I wish I did, but let's plow. Chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts, and I would underline now concerning spiritual gifts so that you remember in the future that's what 12 through 14 is all about. Brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Rule number one for spiritual gifts, you need to know about them. How do I know? Because verse 1 says that. You don't want to be unaware of them or ignorant of them. You need to know about these. Now, it's easy, verses 1 and 2, to get confused about the actual work of God. When you come from a Christless and spiritless background like the pagans did, it's easy for them to be mystified by how God works. Jews 
would be less mystified than, than pagan background Corinthians. Why? Because Jews had a long history of God doing things like manifestations and powerful presence. All the way back to Moses we've got that. But if you're a pagan and you've lived your life basically in the dark arts and dark superstitions of the pagan world, you need instruction. So verse 2 says, you know that when you were pagans you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is a Lord except by this Holy Spirit. Here's what he says. God sets the boundaries on the use of the gifts in order that they can produce a desired effect. And if you see people going, I'm a Christian and Jesus is accursed, he's not. That's not the Spirit of God. That's something else. The problem is, when you have people that are led by revelations in the congregation, how do you know which ones are right? See, if we all open up our Bible to the same thing, we can debate the objective text. We all know that verse 2 says what it says. Now, we might have differences of opinion as to how to apply it, but it still says the words that are there, right? But if, if, if everybody comes together on Sunday morning and, and Luke gets up and he says, I have a vision from Jesus and this is what I saw. We should sell this building and go downtown and buy two other buildings and they should be this big. How do you know Jesus just said that or maybe Luke's been eating mushrooms again? How do you know it's real? So the problem was the manifest presence of God was at work, but you couldn't always tell when it was him. So in verse 3, he says, let me give you one of the rules of thumb. If people are saying Jesus is Lord, then they're saying it from the Spirit. And if they're saying Jesus is accursed, they're not. Now, in this room, among you, you're all going, well, duh. But there in the first century, you're in the 21st. You've had 20 centuries more to digest this. This is new to them. So they're going, oh, okay, so if he gets up and he speaks badly of Jesus, that would be not really the Spirit of God, right? Good! Okay, we're catching on. Okay, That's, this is elemental. In the first century, standing up and saying, Jesus is my master, could get you killed. So people aren't going to do that on a whim, okay? What he's saying is, the guy who takes that stand, not just he read the card and said, oh, Jesus is Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord. That's not what he's doing. This is not a chorus on a Sunday night. This is a guy who's taking his life in his hands. Nobody's going to step up and say, I believe in Jesus, he leads my life, if the Spirit of God is not working him. Either that or he's suicidal, okay? Now, the other part of this is verse 4. The problem is that there's a lot of people who think that in the unity of God that that means that because God is united, there can only be one kind of gift. By the way, one of the things the enemy seems to bring back around over and over and over is this one-size-fits-all idea. That, that if there's any difference, there's got to be discrimination. Here's the thing. We're all different, Okay? Did God discriminate against you because he made you two feet shorter or two, two feet taller or 12 inches this way or that color hair? I mean, really, at a certain point, isn't everything really that we're all different? So God is pretty creative, you know? Look at verse 4. It says, there are varieties of gifts. And he says, there are varieties of ministries. But in both cases, same Spirit, same Lord. There's a variety of effects, but the same God who works in all, all things, in all persons. Not everybody has the same work of God going on inside of them, and not everybody looks the same when God is working in them. This is a biblical component, and I think it needs to be said more. Because I think there's still a bunch of believers who are walking around with the same fundamental disagreement. If you don't have my gift, you're not really filled with the Holy Spirit, is another manifestation of people who don't get that God doesn't have to do the same thing in everybody at the same time. The verses say, wait a minute, God's working in all kinds of people. That's what he's doing. And some of them he's working in have this gift and some that manifestation. And then it says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All right, although there are many manifestations, what is the point of your giftedness? So the common good means the good of the body. 
I am not given a gift so that I can become more cool. I am not given a gift so that I can be featured on The Tonight Show. I am given a gift to benefit the body. That is its purpose. Therefore, everything you know about yourself and your own gifts means they are for God's use in the body. They should be telling you and informing you how to serve. By the way, they don't tell you to serve. You already should know that. It's how to serve. Where do I serve? I'm a teacher. It's all I know how to do. So I teach nonstop, most days. The point is that, that if you're a gift of mercy person, you pour it on with the gift of mercy. All right, let's come back and take a look. It says, for to one is given the, the wisdom through the spirit and to another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. I want you to know that there are two Greek words for another. And we're going to do some filling in here again. The word another has two forms. Alas and heteros. Okay? Alas is another of the same kind. <clears throat> heteros is another of a different kind. So I'm going to ask you to put an A and an H, like we did with S's, spiritual and physical. I want you to put an A for alas and an H for heteros. That's going to make a chart for us out of the Bible. Okay? Go back to verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to A, alas, another of the same kind, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Everybody understand? Verse 9. To H, heteros, another of a different kind, faith by the same spirit, and to A, alas, another of the same kind, gifts of healing by one, the one spirit, verse 10, and to A, alas, another of the same kind, the effecting of miracles, and to A, alas, another of the same kind, prophecy, and to A, alas, another of the same kind, the distinguishing of spirits. Everybody with me so far? Middle of verse 10. Are you okay? Okay. Middle of verse 10. To H, heteros, another of a different kind, various kinds of tongues. And to A, alas, another of the same kind, the interpretation of tongues. Now stop there. Here's what you just did. You just did three categories. Do you see them? The first category has in it word of wisdom. Followed by another of the same kind, which is what? Word of knowledge. Now, after that, it says heteros. A second kind of gift is what? Faith. But of that same kind, healing of that same kind effecting miracles or working miracles and of that same kind prophecies. And distinguishing spirits. Then there's a third kind. What's the third kind? <coughs> Tongues. And what goes along with that? Interpretation. Okay, what he's saying is, it's clear if you're reading it in Greek, it's not clear if you're reading it in English, and that's the reason you did that. Okay? He says, there are three different kinds of gifts. He says there are gifts that have to do with word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Then there's another different set of gifts that you may have inside this, which is faith, healing, miracles, prophecies, distinguishing of spirits. But there's still another kind that is tongues and interpretation of tongues. 
Now, why does he tell you there are three different kinds? I have no idea. I can only tell you that, biblically speaking, they're not all the same. That there's a different way in which the Spirit of God works in these three cases. And even within them, the guy who's doing healings is not necessarily the same one doing distinguishing spirits. Distinguishing spirits just means somebody got up and said something. How do we know if it was the Spirit of God? When you get down to verse 11, one, one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually just as he wills. I would like you to do some irreducible minimum underlining for a minute. Go back to chapter 12, verse 1, and start underlining the, as follows. Okay? 12.1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Verse 2. You were pagans led to mute idols. For the benefit of the girls in the back there, irreducible minimum is like making syrup out of something. So what we do is we cut down all the verse, all the words in the verse you don't need to remember what it's about. It's not that the other words aren't important. It's that if somebody walks up and asks you a question, you only look at what you underlined to get the kind of bones of it. Okay? All right. So verse 2, you were pagans led to mute idols. Verse 3, one speaking, Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. Notice I only picked one of the two because I thought the other one sounded absurd enough that you'd remember. Verse 4, there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. There are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. Verse 5, varieties of ministries, same Lord. Six, varieties of effects, same God. Verse seven, each is given manifestation for the common good. Now verses eight, nine, and ten, this is what I did. I underlined each of the gifts. So word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, Miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues. I don't know, did I forget one in there? Anyway, just underline all the gifts. Verse 11, one spirit works all. End of verse 11, as he wills. Now, I want you to do something right now. Skip over to the end of chapter, uh, verse 18. Uh, verse 18, do you see, just as he desired... Now draw a line, underline just as he desired and draw a line between 11 and the end of 18. As he wills, as he desired. As he wills at the end of 11 eight, is the same as just as he desired at the end of 18. So what is the basis of God's giving of his gifts? Whatever he wanted to. In other words, can you go and get a gift from God. If he decides to give it to you, can you require him to give it to you? So if you go to a church and they say, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Spirit of God, are they requiring God to give you a gift that they want you to have? Can you do that? No. That's why I'm saying it. Okay? Verse 12, underline in verse 12, one body. Verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. Verse 21, cannot say I have no need of you. All right, what's the second half of chapter 12 about then? There's a body concept, and he says, the body isn't one big eyeball. The body isn't one big toe. The body isn't one big finger. The body is all the parts, and it's only healthy if the parts are A, all there, and B, connected. Disconnected body parts, not helpful. Very painful, not very effective. Okay? So the whole rest of chapter 12 is about how the body is to fit together. Now I'm almost done, and then we'll go to a break. 
Verse 25, so there be, so he says, I'm verse 24, I'm sorry. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member that lacked, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Let me continue my irreducible minimum through the rest of the chapter, and then I'll make a point. Verse 25. Members have same care for one another. Verse 26, if one suffers, all suffer. One honored, all rejoice. Verse 28, God appointed apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, administrations, tongues. Verse 31, earnestly desire the greater gifts. I will show you a more, still more excellent way. Earnestly desire the greater gifts. I will show you still a more excellent way. Okay, now wait a minute. I just told you that the gifts are as God wants them. So how does verse 31 fit into that? How can you earnestly desire these gifts if God gives them wherever he wants? The you is plural. He's not saying you, Zoe, desire this gift. He's saying you, church, desire these gifts. The point is it's a plural. So that a church can go, you know what? We really lack some mercy people around here. I mean, we got so many teachers, but they breathe fire, you know? <laughs> and we're, we're all about holiness, but nobody's nice. We need some nice people. God, can you send us somebody with mercy? And a JoJo shows up. Or you can sit around and you can go, man, we just, we love Jesus, but we are desperate for somebody to organize this because the lights keep getting turned off because nobody remembers to pay the bill. Can you send us a mat, please? And God will send somebody with a gifting to the body because you is plural. You guys, somewhere next to verse 31, put you as a group. Not you as an individual. You don't ask God for an individual gift, but a group can ask God to send somebody with that gift so that the group gets the balance of the gifting. 